Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Annabelle Tiffin. Our top story. Sir Keir Starmer says Boris Johnson was right on levelling up, but that Labour will deliver it. He was speaking during a visit to Leyland in Lancashire as he kicked off his party's election campaign. Also tonight, celebrating the life and achievements of George Harrison with a blue plaque on his childhood home. He could run down the alley and go visit his nan and then run back home again. That was a big deal for a, for a little five-year-old kid. We're on our way to Wembley. Manchester's Reds and Blues get ready for the final of the FA Cup. My missus is a City fan. She tried getting the scarf out last year. We had none of that, so none of that again this year. <laughs> The teenager who persuaded Sybil to play again 80 years after she last tinkled the ivories. And it's taken a while, but eventually some parts of the Northwest saw a glimmer of blue sky to end the day today. How are we doing for the bank holiday weekend? Will there be sunshine? Join me at the end of the programme. I'll give you all the details. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, kicked off his general election campaign in Lancashire today. He told workers that Boris Johnson was right about levelling up, but that his party would deliver it. He also promised to reverse the decline in manufacturing if he gets into power. He was speaking at a builder and timber merchants in Leyland this afternoon, and our reporter Phil McCann was also there. Phil. Yeah, hi, Annabelle. Well, the stage is set then for the general election, and this was the stage just a few hours ago where the general election circus rolled into the northwest in this warehouse, where, surrounded by planks of wood and in front of a strategically placed lorry and forklift truck, uh, Sir Keir Starmer answered questions from a gaggle of the people who worked here on all sorts of issues. Nothing seemed to be off the table, unscripted answers. The reason that he's come well, to the northwest so early on in the election campaign, while there are lots of places in this region that Labour needs to win if they'd have any hope of getting into government. South Ribble, specifically this constituency, well, this is one of those places that they'd need to win if they'd have any hope of having a majority of the seats in the House of Commons so that they can govern um, on their own. Now, manufacturing, very important to this region, as is levelling up the idea that the North West should be just as prosperous as the South East of England. So that's why Sir Keir Starmer, I think, was in a place like this. And when it came to levelling up, he said something to me that might sound a little bit strange. He said Boris Johnson was right. As an idea, it's the right idea, and we are committed to it. Now, I've already started talking to our mayors, Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham in the North West, about how we deliver that in terms of the funding package, the way that we grow the economy locally to make sure that there are um, you know, better jobs, decent jobs in the region, that there's infrastructure and transport we need. So I'm absolutely committed uh, to this. So we will, if you like pick up the idea of levelling up that the government has left there um, and deliver on it because I do think that in 2019 um, the Boris Johnson was right to identify uh, this but if there's one thing worse in politics than playing on people's fears it's playing on people's hopes and I think that's what they did. We will, we will follow through. HS2, you're not going to resurrect it. Could you back any kind of replacement in the manifesto? In terms of transport in the North West, it's shocking. Yeah, not, not, that's north to south, but I think within the northwest there's a real feeling, um, you know, northern powerhouse rail, but also buses, absolute, um, you know, essential for people getting around, getting to work. What I've done is to say to our mayors, I want to work with you so that you can input into what is the best transport infrastructure um, for the northwest. Now, he's also asked about those controversial plans for a coal mine in Cumbria, which he said uh, are not, uh, it would not be the way forward if he wins power. And he also talked about Martin's Law, which we've reported a lot on this programme in memory of Martin Hett, who was killed in the Manchester Arena bombing. His mum, Fegan Murray, walked to Westminster just this week um, to campaign for uh, the new law, which is all about tightening security at public venues. And today, Sir Keir Starmer criticised the Prime Minister for not getting that through before the election. If he doesn't get it through, we will do it as a priority for an incoming Labour government if we're privileged enough to come in to serve. And I said that to her on Wednesday, and I say it again um, today. Obviously, um, the Prime Minister, in my view, wasn't being straight with her. 
So there'll be a lot more warehouses, Annabelle, lots more lorries and forklift trucks that the politicians can stand in front of or perhaps even inside over the next few weeks. They will indeed. Phil, thank you very much. Now, the cost of renting a home in the northwest has increased by nearly 10% in the last year alone. The average rent is now nearly £850 a month. The figures come from the property website Zoopla, Zoopla, and all this week we've been focusing on how the housing market is changing in our region. So prices are high, but so is demand, as Ed Hansen found out in Liverpool. This quiet street in Anfield in Liverpool is about to get a lot of new visitors. So... Here we are, living room. Yeah. As you see, it's a nice size living room. Patience and her dad, Charles, are the first area. to view this two-bed terrace. Cost to rent, £670 a month. And business is very brisk. We can get, God, 500 views in 24 hours on a property. We've, for this particular property, have had over 100 inquiries within the first couple of days. We qualify a number of inquiries, we get four or five viewings booked in and then we actually hide the property from the online advertising because otherwise the phones just keep ringing and from following that we carry out the viewings and usually within seven days on average that property is let. The average rent in the North West is nearly £850 a month, up almost 10% on last year. I'll show you upstairs. Three years ago it was about, you could get um, a house for like 500 now you can't get a house like a full house like this for like 500 should be like 600 seven 800 yeah just for two bedrooms yeah so th this is on for 675 isn't it yeah so do you think that's uh expensive or a fair price i think it's fair comparing to um the ones i've been looking so they are um 800 700 so i think this is quite fair yeah a lack of properties to rent, high mortgage rates and people wanting to work some of the week from home after the pandemic are just some of the factors that are fueling this high demand for houses and flats. So you'd think that landlords would be queuing up for more business, but it's more complicated than that. A report by Savile shows that uh, rents are at their lowest since uh, 2007, sub 4% profit, so 3.8%. And so this is about additional cost. It's not about landlords making extra revenue. This is about tax. It's about um, uh, mortgage costs. It's about increased costs of running your business. In Liverpool, like other areas, the council is powerless to influence what private landlords charge but a licensing scheme tries to ensure renters get a good deal. It can give tenants the assurance that they live in a safe property with a responsible landlord. It gives the council the assurance that there is a responsible party to go to about concerns about the safety of the interior, the appearance of the exterior, or the behaviour of the tenants. Where landlords in, a, in an area covered by selective licensing do not have a licence, they will be subject to enforcement. Building more houses would ease demand, but figures released in November revealed the government hadn't met its annual target of building 300,000 new homes in England. They take both salaries into account. Um, they do reference checks in terms of... When all the viewings are over, the landlord will ultimately decide if Patience and her parents can move in here. In the meantime, tenants looking for a new home will have to continue to move quickly. Ed Hansen, BBC Northwest Tonight, Liverpool. Right, let's get a roundup of some of the day's other news now. And the child serial killer Lucy Letby has lost her fight uh, for permission to appeal against her convictions. Last August, the former nurse was found guilty of murdering seven babies and attempting to murder another six at the Countess of Chester Hospital in 2015 and 2016. The Court of Appeal hasn't made public the reason for its decision. A pilot who died when his light aircraft flew into a cliffside on the Isle of Man last July crashed the plane deliberately, an inquest has concluded. 64-year-old Carl Bethany died when his Cessna aircraft crashed into Brada Head near Port Erin. The inquest heard he had called his partner to say sorry and tell her that he loved her in the minutes before the incident. And the Manchester Flower Festival is back today for its seventh year, celebrating Manchester icons such as Carolina Hearn, Emmeline Pankhurst and Sir Ian McKellen across ten gardens and installations in the city centre. There's also a tribute garden to Girls Aloud in St Anne's Square. 
Now, one of Liverpool's most famous sons, George Harrison, has had a blue plaque unveiled on the two-up, two-down, where he was born. The unveiling marks the start of an eight-week public nomination period, during which people can submit nominations to Historic England for people they'd like to see recognised. To qualify, the person needs to have died at least 20 years ago, have made an exceptional impact in their field and have one surviving building associated with them. Well, Eunice Muller was in Liverpool at 12 Arnold Grove in Wavertree today as the life and achievements of George Harrison was celebrated. In this very ordinary looking suburb, time to make a fuss about the quiet beetle. This two up, two down Victorian terrace in Wavertree was home to George Harrison. His widow Olivia told me a new blue plaque is a source of family pride. I think George had, had a, a confidence about him because they were cozy. There's something about these small family places and, and what you learn, you learn how to respect one another and how to respect other people's space. And he also had freedom, a little bit of freedom, where he could run down the alley and go visit his nan. And... I got my mind set on you. I got my mind set. The guitarist died of cancer in 2001, aged 58, but his music had already left a footprint on the world and this street. Uh, we do get a lot of visitors from all over the world, literally. Five times a day, every day. No, they come from everywhere, it's great. It's nice for the streets. Like... And to think, you know, George Harrison once lived here. I know. Always get people talking about it, yeah. Brilliant. Long needed, uh, always thought of. He lived here until he was seven. The family moved away in the 1950s. How long have you had this house? I've had the house 70 years. Well, my husband was, was, was friendly with George Harrison anyway. I didn't actually know him, but he did. Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago. Otherwise, he would have been absolutely enthralled. In his memoir, George Harrison said Arnold Grove was just like Coronation Street. The house was pleasant and it was always sunny in summer. I don't know. Here Comes the Sun was, of course, one of the tracks he wrote with the Beatles, although often overshadowed by John Lennon and Sir Paul McCartney's work. But after their split, he was the first of the Fab Four to top the charts with My Sweet Lord. Today's unveiling marks the start of a period during which people can submit nominations for other people they'd also like to see recognised. It's not just for people who are already international celebrities, it's for people who did great things and maybe are under-recognised. From his humble beginnings to global stardom, George Harrison never forgot his roots. Eunice Muller, BBC Northwest, tonight, Liverpool. Well deserved to have that tribute. Now, for the last few months, we've been following the diving journey of Mohammed Salim Patel and Sean Gash. Now, Salim, who's blind, and Sean, who uses a wheelchair, are training to become the world's first disabled deep-sea diving duo. Today, we discover how specialist military equipment has been adapted by a Northwest company to help Sean and Salim. We've got the spirit, we've got the mind, but we need people to come in and wrap around us that have that knowledge, that have the skill set. If you come down to the front on the chest, that's where your inflator would be. So today we've come to Northern Diver in Wigan and the plan is that we're going to get measured up for our dry suits so that we can dive in any temperature and see what other equipment they've got that can help us on our journey. So then we've got 12 here. They're actually tailor measuring me from my first fully functional fitted suit. The first time I went diving where it was absolutely, uh, I mean, I was that cold and my head was, was hurting and um, my body couldn't regulate its temperature. Whereas this suit, I'm gonna be able to dive in the quarries that we are and not worry about feeling cold, not worrying about um, breaking down in tears, which is what I did. When it's uh, on the backpack, it's really quite comfortable and it's quite solid on your back. For Sean, they've developed an underwater scooter that allows him to make it much easier for him to travel underwater. We do a lot of different equipment for special forces, man countermeasures. It's a spin-off from a, a product that we, we manufacture for militaries in other countries uh, and it's a, a diver propulsion system. 
this is military equipment that we're using that they've actually modified military equipment for for me to use. You can get your body right into the unit so it's on the upper half of your body where all your yeah, movement is. We needed to give him something that he could hold on to but adapt the thrusters so that they were on the side of the battery pack. And what can you say? You, I mean, I can't ask for anything else. It just gives me, me more freedom, more flexibility, more confidence underwater. This is all to give you an idea yeah. like how it should take. The, the comms is, is the most exciting thing yeah. to me. When I'm on the surface, my main form of communication is through my ears and speech. And when you're underwater, you don't really have the ability to communicate. We can't do the normal signs and signals because he can't see it. So Curly looked at how we could uh, modify and come up with certain uh, signs all by touch. What Northern Divers are doing for us is enabling us to make it easier for us to communicate. The communications equipment is actually used by commercial and military divers. The full face mask which has built in communication so that I can communicate with my instructor underwater, not having to rely on the hand skills, although we've learnt them anyway. I feel very proud and very privileged, really, um, to be involved. We feel it's very important to give everybody the opportunity to dive. It's nice to know that there is something here in the northwest where there are people that have such specialisms, little things that make the biggest differences underwater and just enable us to push on in our journey. They're brilliant, aren't they, both of them? All right, let's move on to sport now. Sport, this... Fe uh, sport, what's your name? <laughs> Richard, know. you're all the Try way over there. Sport. <laughs> I am sport. <laughs> this, this feels like deja vu, doesn't it? We've it got does. Manchester United, Manchester City, replay of, of last year. Is it going to be a replay of the result, I wonder? <laughs> well, we'll see, Annabelle. Yeah. But as you know, City won the day last year. Yeah. And as you'd probably expect, a strong favourites to lift the trophy again. The Blues are trying to become the first team to win back-to-back -back domestic league and FA Cup doubles as well. For United, with speculation mounting that manager Eric Ten Hag will be sacked even if his team wins, it's a chance to end an underwhelming season with a major trophy. City are really going to win. Of course they're going to win. Hoping we're going to give them a good pace in tomorrow. It'd be the cream on the cake, wouldn't it, really? To be fair to them, they are better. But... Are you worried? Uh, I'm so worried. I'm so worried. I'll be heartbroken if I lose. I think City are going to win. <laughs> Do you? You don't think you, Manchester United have a chance? No, I don't. Well, my missus is a City fan. She tried getting the scarf out last year. We had none of that, so none of that again this year. So folding out the game, then we might have a chance. Might have a chance. I feel like when the special occasion comes, playing against United um, at Wembley, um, yeah, it definitely, definitely means a little bit more for me. Fun there. We lost twice against City already, so <laughs> brother, we'll go there to kill. We'll go there to win. Complacency anything that could affect Manchester City? Yes, I think that's for any side, isn't it, who are favourites, but I think they've got a certain guy called Pep Guardiola. And fans just walking around, going around the city at work, the rivalry, the Manchester derby is always there. Um, yes, United fans are a little bit fragile, we understand why, and they'll be looking to try and say, can we have a little bit of pride back because we're getting it rammed down our throats from these City supporters. A rivalry that, of course, both managers are well aware of, with Pep Guardiola chasing more history and Eric Ten Hag trying to secure his future. I'm just focusing on the job I have to do, and that is first win the game on Saturday. A completely, completely different game than the fact that this time's on the Premier League, that's for sure. All part of a very special Derby Day final. I'll be at Wembley for us. Should be a cracker. Now, St Helens will be aiming to go back to the top of Super League tonight with a win over Leeds Rhinos. With Lee Leopards also in action against Huddersfield, the first match since Challenge Cup winning coach Adrian Lamb signed a new three-year contract. We went in 5-5 and, like I said, I was just saying to myself, you're on it till the end now. So I go to New York on Monday. But before that, I'll watch United in the, in the FA Cup. Um, but no, I just can't wait to go to New York, see what happens there and then just have a holiday for a week. It's amazing, isn't it? In the county championship, bad light reduced the amount of play at Old Trafford with Lancashire holding Warwickshire to 89 for three at the end of the first day, Annabelle. Uh, hopefully the weather will be better tomorrow. Kay, also known as weather, will tell us. I know. You are. You're like Ken, aren't you, in Barbie? I am He's sport. beach, you're sport. Kay's weather, yeah. your Kay's news. Weather. I'm news. <laughs> Got that cleared up. Thank you.
Now, a 90-year-old woman who lost her sight five years ago has taken up playing the piano again after 80 years, thanks to a teenage volunteer. Sybil Pither moved into a care home in Salford in January. At the same time, Aaliyah Woodsbury became a volunteer there. The two found they had a shared love of the piano, and Juliet Phillips takes up the sport. <laughs> Ninety-year-old Sybil has never lost her love of music, and now she's rediscovered her passion for performing. After decades, she was inspired to return to the piano by listening to volunteer Aaliyah playing for residents. Well, I thought, what lovely music that is, and I wish I could have kept on my piano lessons, playing like that. I'd be able to be happy in this. <laughs> carers home and I'd make all the other people happy and it all come for a sing song. Since then the pair have become quite the double act. Even losing her eyesight hasn't stopped Sybil patiently practicing to relearn all the notes. Never give up in life. Never. Keep going. If you give up you've had it. What's it like when the two of you are playing together? Oh, it's happiness. Sheer happiness. 17-year-old Aaliyah has been working at the care home as a volunteer while studying social care at college. Despite their 73-year age gap, she and Sybil have struck up quite a bond. Uh, the first time she ever played it, I didn't expect her to come and play on the piano. I thought she'd press a few notes and then let, and we were sat there for hours playing it. She loved it. I've never actually played with another person on the piano with me. I've, like, I've always sat with someone next to me while I'm playing, but never with someone with me. And Honestly, she does really like it. And I like seeing how happy it makes her. The knife and fork to the left for you if you want it. Sybil only moved into Kenyon Lodge a few months ago. Staff at the care home tell me she's settled in much better since playing music again. You've got a cup of tea, Sybil, if you want it. She was quite distressed when she first came in, but since she started the music therapy and playing the piano again, she's much calmer. No one knew that Sybil could play the piano, her family didn't know, and the fact she'd gone blind several years ago, it's just a beautiful story, and the joy on Sybil's face when she's playing is just amazing. When she completes her studies, Aaliyah is hoping to work in the care home permanently. No doubt there'll be plenty more performances to come. <laughs> Juliet Phillips, BBC Northwest Tonight, Salford. Aaliyah and Sybil, there, such a special relationship. That was so lovely. Uh, right, Kay, weather. <laughs> as we're now going to just call you weather. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll answer to anything. Yes, yeah. you know, Annabelle. <laughs> but it's bank holiday, so Ooh. we're banking on some good weather. Right. OK. Well, I'll just go and get my coat then. Okay. Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, bank holiday, so, I mean, what can you expect in the northwest? We are going to be seeing some rain. We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, we, today, I know it took a while, it's been a good few days where we've had the cloud and the rain. We just started to see a few hints of blue sky, a little bit of brightness after predominantly cloudy skies over the past few days. So thank you for sending those pictures in. If you would like to send in your pictures, you can do so. They should be, there you go, on the screen right now. Join me on socials, I've had some lovely messages, but also you can become a weather watcher as well. So, bank holiday weather, how are we faring? The best day out of the bank holiday, or rather the best morning, is tomorrow. It's going to be a fresh start to the day, but plenty of sunshine through the morning. We are looking at some showers later, then widespread showers expected Sunday and bank holiday Monday. So, what's going on? On. Well, we've got this weak ridge of high pressure to thank for the calm weather through tomorrow morning. This little front's going to give us some cloudier skies into the afternoon and then the low pressure starts to retreat back in again. And that's the reason why we're going to get some showers. So, not dry for the bank holiday weekend. 
but dry as we head overnight tonight. With a few patches of mist and fog as the breeze is really quite light and temperatures under clearer skies will we'll probably get down to about seven or eight degrees. Cooler than that actually in some spots. So it will be a fresh but fine start. We'll lose any patches of mist and fog at first. Lengthy spells of sunshine through the morning. A scattering of showers, few and far between. Very unlucky if you catch those, but into uh, more western parts, sorry, more eastern parts, we'll get the cloud pulling in and some outbreaks of rain. Now, in the sunshine, we should get 19 degrees, so it should feel pleasant away from any showers. The front continues to come in. That's through Sunday and into Monday, and there's further fronts heading our way. It is, of course, for many of us, half-term week, so I'm with you when I say... We're going to need our brollies. We're going to be in parks with soggy children. Sunday, widespread showers. Some of these are going to be heavy. You can't rule out the odd rumble of thunder. Technically still showers. There will be some brighter interludes, but it will feel cooler all the while. That is quite a depressing I'm scene, sorry. isn't it? <laughs> so it's half term next week, is it? Yes, See, it's I'm out unsettled. of all that. So, yeah. I know, I am in the throes of that oh, half term. Oh, it's indoor it's... soft play. <sighs> I feel your pain. Um, thank you very much. Have a lovely bank holiday weekend, whatever it is you're doing. Bye bye. Take care.